Hey guys, Jim here, and we're doing something really, really special today. I decided to take a little road trip, visit my buddy Frank Fisher. Hey guys. Hey Frank. And we ended up stumbling across a, uh, well, a living legend, Mr. Stan Wilson. Thank you, sir, for letting us into your shop. Thank you. Welcome to the Insanity. Now, I'm kind of an asshole. Uh, I left my camera in the car, not thinking, oh, we're just going to stop by and see Stan Wilson. We're going to say hi, and he's going to say, bugger off, kid. I got work to do. Instead, I walk in, and he immediately offers me a cigar when I say how nice it smelled in here. And he has spent about the last, what would you say, hour? Eh, about an hour showing me how he assembles some of his knives. And you guys have to realize the level of knife making that this is. This is not your $500 knife. This is not your $1,000 knife. We're looking at, this is what, about a $4,500 hand-built knife? Yeah. Somewhere around there? And showing us the internal processes that go into making this double action automatic that he's building and i just kind of realized i went oh shit i i really i could have been filming this this would have been great so he says oh well i'll just take the whole knife apart again go get your camera so guys you're going to get a chance to see something that well maybe you've never seen anything like it before so i'm going to shut up now and if stan wants to narrate he certainly can well First of all, this is one of my flush button double action autos. And here is my button. So it's almost completely invisible when it's assembled. Yeah, that's the that's the goal. Alright, the button fits rather snugly in here. There's a pocket milled into the back of the button to keep it registered on the sear. The sear is what actually keeps it from rotating out of out of position. This is a all hidden screw knife. This knife is constructed with no screw showing on the outside, yet the whole knife is completely disassemblable. In this case, the customer wants the special tools to be able to take it apart himself. So now this is this is the level of knife making we're talking about, guys. When when Stan was first talking about this knife and he was showing me how he was able to take apart, put it together without seeing any screws on the outside, that's what he told me. The, the customer wanted to be able to take it apart and mire the internals because he finishes every component inside and out, screws that you don't see, everything. They're gold plated and polished, which is kind of silly, but you know. That's and what you I do. changed your system from how you make your knives and altered it so that he was able to take his knife apart when he gets it. Yeah, I just wanted to make it a little more user-friendly. What I had done in the past is instead of having these slots here, I would have a hole drilled up from the back and I'd turn a little dovetail disc that the, the scale would drop on and slide into place. But they can be a little nitpicky when you go to take it off. They sometimes want to tip a little bit so you have to play around to get it on and off. And I just wanted to make it a little easier for him, so I changed the mounting setup instead of having the little dovetail discs. I've got my keyhole slots here. And you see they're recessed on the back side here. And what I did with the scale is this mammoth tooth. I milled a hole and epoxied a plug. So the screw is actually threaded into the plug. So what happens now is this is going to just drop on here and basically slide down into place. So in this case it's easy to just grab it with the screwdriver and lock those down so now the scale is locked into place with no screws showing. It's amazing. That's the second time I've seen this and I'm still as amazed as the first time. <laughs> <laughs> but what the customer is going to get is he's going to get this little sideways driver so you can reach in the knife internally like this, engage the screw and unlock it. But the way this is to be assembled also since you can't have the pivot showing in this case, the pivot on this side is hidden by the button. But this side, the pivot's hidden by the bolster, but there's no screw. So how do we lock down the bolster? Hmm. Or, the, the, or, I mean, the, the blade. Well, what I've done is, if you look at the pivot, it's stepped. There's a little step here. Put my hand behind there so it'll focus. See the little step here on the pivot? There we go. Yep. All right. And I turn my own pivot screws so now I can actually take that screw with my driver and lock that pivot down so now the pivot can't rotate. I've turned another screw 
that's been ground off on the sides. So it's more like a rectangle. There's no driver slot in it. Again, there's another tool to adjust that one. But to lock the blade down, you'd put your blade in. And if this was a final assembly, you'd drop your other washer on there. The liner has a slot cut in it that corresponds with that. And then when you rotate it around, now that's locked down the blade with the proper tension on the washers. So the blade would still run smoothly, but without any side-to-side -side play. So here is the one that I was assembling. We've got our washer in place. You can see this the spring is attached. Since I've hidden the screws, I want to kind of hide the uh, or the, the button. I've hidden the button. I want to kind of hide the way the spring is, so I, I mill a pocket for the spring to set into. So when you look at the knife this way, there's no pin or anything holding that spring in, so it doesn't look like there's really a spring in there. So when the knife is together and you're looking inside with the blade open, you can't see this spring. It's It looks like you're looking at the underside of the backspacer. And right now you see this blue color on here. That's the temper color. So normally when this is all finished, it's all going to be the same color. So everything blends in and hides. So you've hidden your release button. Mm -hmm. You've hidden your spring. Yeah. Nobody can tell if this is an automatic because you're going to put a thumb stud in the blade. Yeah. So it's yeah. going to look like anybody's normal, everyday, manual folding knife. Right. But it's an auto. Even upon further inspection, it still looks like. Yeah. I mean, you, you would have to tear down the knife to be able to even see yeah. the spring that's in here. And there's my... And good luck figuring out how to take it apart. <laughs> <laughs> and what I've been doing for quite a while is cutting a little dovetail on the inside of the spine and setting a piece of gold. So I put my signature on there. It's always found it a little difficult to scribe your name on a piece of Damascus with the nickel band showing it, kind of make it difficult to read. Wow. So if we were to assemble this knife, we would have our pivot locked into place. We have our first washer. The blade would go on. Our second washer gets dropped on. I have to look at this a little closer to make sure it's lined up. Go. I'm going to line my slot up on the blade. I'm going to squeeze it together. Oh, my washer is not quite right. This one still needs a little tuning. There's a little bit of blade wobble, but again, this is not quite finished. And then if I put my frame screws in here. Look at this beautiful file work. God. You can't tell where the blade ends and the back side begins. You can, it's right. There. <laughs> God. Then Scale would drop into place, slide into, into, into the proper. And there's where it gets a little tricky. You got to reach inside here with this little tool and tighten these screws down. Oops. Hell getting old, your eyes go to hell. Right, so now my 
scale is in place and That is a powerful spray in there too. Wow. And here is, there's the button. And that's really the only way you can see that, guys. I mean, it's, it's seamless. It's beautiful. Now this, this is all Damascus. The whole thing is Damascus. Now, now tell me what you're telling me about the, the pattern and why this particular Damascus is so tricky to work with. Well, this pattern is tough to work with because I like to have all my patterns match up from blade to bolster. Some are a lot easier to do, but this one, I don't know if you can really see them, but see these, these bands right here? Those, mm -hmm. those are nickel bands, and they don't go evenly through the steel. They actually, if you looked at the edge of the knife, you could see sometimes there's a band that's going, it's going at a funny angle here. Mm -hmm. And that band is corresponding into here. So you look at this, and you think that band's going this way, when actually it's going that way. So I like to have everything match up as close as I can but these like this band here that you see here I don't know if you can see it was further out here when I ground it it was going this way but I could see that at the end of the blade or at the end of the bolster looking at here so I knew that if I wanted this band to match up with a band here I had to have a band that was gonna on the blade that was gonna show up lower so when this was shaped this one would come in and kinda time into that one so that's what that black line is right there. I was trying to demonstrate where that one band of nickel is. So this band of nickel comes in and joins into that one. So guys, when, you, when you're looking at a knife that a knife maker makes and puts out on his table for eight, nine hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, and either a dealer has run in and snatched it up or some other collector that's not really in it for the love of the hobby, but just to make a quick buck, and he takes that eight or nine hundred dollar knife with exposed screws everywhere, you know, the, the normal common knife that we're used to seeing. Not with this level of detail and selling them for three, four, five, six thousand dollars. How easy is it now to justify that purchase? And I don't want to use any particular knife makers names because it's not really fair to them. They're not the ones that are creating that frenzy. But you take that basic flipper knife or tool knife of some sort that we may love or we may admire it may be hard to get. But when they're charging four and five thousand dollars for, let's say, three V or S thirty five VN on a titanium S six AL four V titanium frame, and you look at a knife here that's at the same price range, done in all Damascus, a completely hidden release, double action, hidden leaf spring, hand assembly, and the hand filing—that's a whole other thing that we were talking about. We actually got to watch Stan as he sat here with these files and started hand filing that backside profile right here in front of me. This is the kind of work that goes into a real four, five, ten, fifteen thousand dollar knife, guys. And that's why it's so frustrating for me and why I vented so often about what the secondary market is doing to the pricing. This is an incredible work of art. There's no way, no other way to word it. And this is something that you can carry, that you can use. It's designed to be used. Or it could sit in a uh, plexiglass display case with a pretty little halogen light over it just to show your friends when they come over. And this is, I mean, he hasn't fired the Damascus. He hasn't done anything with it. And it's still beautiful as it sits with that, that nice sheen to it, that nice polish to it. Now, you said you were going to be probably doing, like, blue on this? Yeah, it's going to be hot blue. Oh, Guys, if you haven't checked out Stan Wilson's website, do it. You get to see some beautiful photography of amazing knives and really see what an artist can do with his own two hands. I mean, yeah, I mean, he's got an incredible shop here. And yeah, there's a lot of machines. Do, do, do you see, a, is there a CNC hidden behind the bench anywhere here? No CNC. No, no CNC. No water jet back there by the sink? No. The no. closest thing I got to automated is my old Brown and Sharp's automatic surface grinder, which is older than I am. This is knife making, guys. Some guy that, you know, listen, being a machinist is a, an admirable uh, an admirable trade. And it's great to take a machinist and teach him how to make knives and he becomes a knife maker. That's how so many have started. But when they just want to be a machinist and they want to take that blade, machine everything, and then put it on a consumer-grade sharpener and call themselves a knife maker, this is where I take issue with it because this is knife making.
right here, right here on this bench, with all these wonderfully assorted tools that all belong in their own little home. There's a little madness going on here. I, I guess you guys can see that. Can you show us that badass grinder real quick? Oh, yeah, yeah. This thing, guys, I'm sure you've seen a million videos, Tough Thumbs and everybody else. You get to see their grinders. This thing is something unbelievable. Check this out. This is, uh, Travis Works built this. It's the T, I forget exactly what his brand name or his model number is, if what, but it's the greatest, I find it's the most versatile grinder that I've got because <laughs> it goes horizontal. So if you got to profile something, especially with, a, on a small wheel, over the most women. With small wheel attachment on here. Put your tool rest, tip the whole thing sideways, and now you can profile nice and easy. You can see your lines. It just makes it life a lot easier. That is crazy. And it's a fast little bitch, too. Oh, he cranked it up earlier and it was insane. Uh, check out my Instagram if you can. It, by the time you see this video, it could be buried. But we, he was shooting sparks all over this little tiny room. It's you crazy. Want, you want the spark show again? What the hell? Give the, the YouTube viewers the full experience, I suppose. Well, we'll put a big wheel on here. And it's just a little, little plate of titanium, guys. Nothing crazy. There's no magic in this. And a somewhat worn out 60 grit belt. Crank it up to full speed and here we go. <laughs> that is incredible incredible there's so many wonderful little toys in here i tell you this has been a fantastic experience uh so guys there it is there's a little peek into stan wilson's shop check out his website um yeah it's probably not going to be anytime soon that i get a chance to to review one of his knives but anybody out there and i'm calling out to you guys again for guest blade anybody out there that owns one of his knives let me know if you're willing to donate it uh to do a little review on i'd love to give people other views of the other knives that he's done obviously we're not going to review this it's still in pieces and parts and i'm sure the owner wants to get it as soon as possible but uh, this is a little bit, a tiny little glimpse into what he does every single day. And uh, Stan, thank you for taking time out of your day to do it. I Thanks appreciate it. Over. All right, guys, I'm going to go for now, and I will see if I can get some more out to you soon. Thanks.